So yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, this project that I've been working on here in collaboration with Gilbor. <coughs> so topic is, well, the dynamical system is very familiar, the Kepler problem. And um, I guess <clears throat> one point of the talk would be that even for this, for this familiar system, there's some very, uh, some interesting geometry uh, involved in the, the family of curves, which is called the Kepler orbits. So <clears throat> um, I wanted to start just by oops, reminding quickly what's mean by the Kepler problem. And I'll, we'll just talk about the planar Kepler problem. So you consider these trajectories um, of a point mass in the plane uh, subject to Newton's inverse square law from a fixed source. So like the sun you think of. <clears throat> so as a differential equation, uh, choosing units so that this constant of proportionality is one. This is the, the differential ODE, second order ODE in the plane. And <clears throat> well, what's relevant the way you describe, you can describe all the solutions by means of Kepler's laws. So the trajectories trace out a conic section. So here's a elliptic orbit. And the, these conic sections always have a focus fixed at this source of the sun. And the way that you move along these orbits is that uh, the area in blue here increases at a constant rate. The rate depends on the, the orbit. It uh, depends on the angular momentum of the orbit. And then this third law for uh, closed orbits, the elliptic orbit says that the period is related to the major axis, which is really just a way of expressing this normalization constant here being set to one. And something else I want to recall from it is that well, the, the energy, so this is a natural system. You have kinetic energy plus a potential energy, potential or force function is like one over R, where R is the distance to the sun. This energy is inversely proportional to the major axis. So if I call the major axis 2A, uh, it's the inverse of the energy. And well, you have to choose the sign. So for, well, I guess for this, uh, this is an elliptic orbit, so I should have a minus sign there. Sorry about that. But, uh, okay, so let's let's see Kepler problem. Nice, simple, something familiar, I think. So the topic here will be the Kepler orbits, which are just the the family of curves. So we forget about the parameterization and you just have this set of curves in the plane, which are all the conics in the plane having fixed focus, the orbits of the, of the system. So um, a nice way or a standard way you can parameterize these orbits is as follows. So R is the radial distance to the sun and A1, A2, and C are the parameters. So um, C is the angular momentum impact. And well, if you know some more, A1 and A2 are the components of the Runge Linus vector, but it's not really that important. There's, this is a way to parameterize conics in the plane with a focus at the origin. So we have a three parameter family of curves in the plane. And so this is the, what I mean by the geometry, you want to know what are the properties of this family of curves. So, so a nice or a very useful thing when you're studying uh, geometry or some kind of objects is to, to learn about their symmetries. You know, how can you move the family of curves around in the plane? <clears throat> so this is what we'll call orbital symmetries. So we have, transformations of the plane, so that if you take the image of any one of these conic sections under the 
transformation, you get another Kepler orbit, another conic section with the same fixed focus at the sun. <clears throat> For example, you can just rotate everything around the origin or dilate scale everything around the origin. You could reflect through a line to the origin. This will, these will be orbital symmetries. <clears throat> so uh, down here, I, I just want to make like some uh, historical comments, I guess. So <clears throat> the first one is that, well, from the start, it's like we, we sort of forgot all the dynamics, but we, I should make some comments since this is dynamic seminar <clears throat> about this interesting work of uh, this mathematician, Edward Kasner. He has a kind of a lecture note called Geometric Aspects of Dynamics. And well, there's some, there's lots of very interesting things in this reference. But for example, um, anytime you take a force law in the plane, you determine a three parameter family. Well, there's some exceptions where you get a two parameter family, but in general, you get a three parameter family of unparametrized curves in the plane when you take a force, some force law in the plane. Oops. And so this guy Kasner has, has shown that uh, these three parameter families of curves that arrive, arise from dynamical problems from force laws in the plane uh, can actually, if you know the whole three parameter family of curves, you can recover the force law up to scaling by a constant because uh, you, if, if you have some force law on the plane, you can always multiply the, the force by a fixed, no positive number and you have the same trajectories. So up to that constant, the, the three parameter family of curve actually determines the force law or determines the dynamics. So that's... Um, um, may, may I quickly add? These uh, curves are in general not even closed curves, right? So for general force law. So yeah, yeah, if you have a general force law, yeah, they yeah, they could be, yeah. Not, not such a nice family as the Kepler problem, yeah. But in the setting of the Kepler, oh yeah, go ahead. The statement still holds, I guess. To, yeah, the statement. Non-closed curves and it still works. Yeah, so so given a three, so I mean, it's kind of like you can go both ways. You could have some force law in the plane. It determines a bunch of parameterized trajectories, but then you just say, forget the parameterization. This will give you a, a three parameter, a family of curves in the plane that depends on three parameters. And conversely, given a three parameter family of curves that arises in this way, you can recover the force law without knowing the parameterization to start. So you determine it up to parameterization by some constant multiple of the time. <clears throat> so maybe I should, to make it this Kasner thing more clear, kind of for, for this setting, it says that if you just take Kepler's first law, you recover the inverse square law up to multiplication by, by a constant here. That's, that's what it would say, but it works for general first law, his result. Um, so yeah, so this is a kind of <clears throat> tells you that uh, geometry and dynamics are very close, right? Geometry of three parameter families of curves are in a sense very much the same as dynamics of force laws in the plane. Certain three parameter family of curves. You can, you can make three parameter families of curves that are not corresponding to dynamical systems, but it's a sort of subclass. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so this is one thing, you know, we're seemed like we're forgetting the dynamics, but there really is, the, you know, this is contained in the geometry of this family. And um, another sort of comment is, you know, we're talking about geometry of families of curves in the plane. This is also very classic and like well-studied subject. You know, the, kind of the origins of Lee algebras. Um, Tress was a student of Lee who classified two parameter families of curves in the plane. 
and then Carton, all the kind of the classic work in this subject. <coughs> but um, so if you know that, great. But if not, then we just keep going. Um, the point is that I want that, or the topic here is we have this specific family of curves, and what we'd like to study what are properties of it and I mean the first thing that is very useful is to determine what kind of transformations of the plane preserve the form of curves <clears throat> okay so here's the first result so this orbital symmetries these transformations of the plane Preserving conics with a fixed focus. It's much more than just these rotations and dilations. It's actually a action of a seven dimensional group. Okay. This group is the same thing as the conformal transformations of Minkowski space. So CO21 and then R21 is like translations in Minkowski space. And <clears throat> Turns out from these results of Lee Carton, actually just the, the older results of Lee, he's, he determined that for a three parameter family of curves, the largest possible symmetry group it can have is in fact this exact one. So, <clears throat> well, if you're used to the Kepler problem, you know that it's kind of special uh, dynamical system, for example, is super integrable, but also from this perspective of unparameterized orbits and these things are also called point symmetries or lead point symmetries. It's also a very symmetric family of curves. In fact, I mean, the most that it could be. <clears throat> so this, this last little part is, is essentially the result of Lee for three parameter families of curves. Uh, maybe I'll mention, it's usually presented this maximal locally, this maximal thing in terms of an ODE or the solutions of just this, the easiest third order ODE you can write down in the XY plane. So uh, vertical parabolas. So derivative of Y with respect to X. Okay, but it turns out this can also be realized this maximal symmetry thing as the space of Kepler orbits. And here I just wrote down uh, the formula for the action. Just it's nice to write down explicit formulas. So here I have x, y are my coordinates, Cartesian coordinates on the Kepler plane. And you take this vector x, y, r being the radial distance, you apply the matrix in CO2, 1. And then I put a little pi here, just means take the first two components of this result. And then you can also divide by this thing here where you have sort of a projective transformation. Um, in fact, they're gonna be very related to projective geometry. Okay, so this is, and I've, I've kind of ignored really all of these statements should say local because you see here, if V is non-zero, you have say a line where that gets sent to infinity. So they are, they can actually kind of, uh, they're really defined on the projective plane, these transformations. They can send an elliptic orbit or part of an elliptic orbit to a branch of a hyperbolic orbit. So things can all get, very flexible. <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of the starting point. I want to, before I talk about like examples of what are they good for these symmetries or what some things you can use them for, I want to say how you see this action rather than just writing a formula. So here's you know, the way <clears throat> you can build uh, the picture of how these things act. And it's, I think it's nice to prevent it in two sort of stages. So the first stages you think of R3, um, coordinates X, Y, Z. So this Kepler plane, I'm thinking of as the Z equals zero, the X, Y plane here. And I put in this cone, X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. So on the upper half, Z is just like the radial distance R. So if you recall that parameterization we had of Kepler orbits, it's like R is A1X plus A2Y plus C squared. 
to rearrange things, I assume that the inner momentum is non-zero. This is a Kepler orbit, okay, with some new names for the parameters, little a, little b, little c. So this is just the equation for intersect the cone with a plane and project orthogonally onto the xy plane. So a better way or an easier way for seeing the symmetries to, to think of these Kepler orbits is to lift them to intersections with the cone by planes. And you kind of have a choice here. You could lift to the upper cone or the lower cone. Let's say we just lift to the upper cone in general. But now it's easy to see a lot more symmetries, right? You just take a linear transformation of R3 that preserves the cone. It will, for being linear, it will preserve affine planes and it will preserve the family of Kepler orbits. This group of transformations of R3 preserving the cone is well, the Lorentz group and scalings, so CO2 one. <clears throat> this is a four dimensional group. To see, well, to see these other ones, these translations, you again kind of enlarge your vision, or lift up to a bigger space. So you have this picture in R3, and you think of this R3 as sitting inside real projective space, the uh, affine chart. This cone can be closed up to a uh, degenerate quadratic in RP3. Mm -hmm. This is in, say, right, X, Y, Z, or I should maybe write this. I'm thinking of RP3 as having these homogeneous coordinates. Okay, the general point of RP3. <clears throat> so this is just. Um, we're seeing this C bar in this specific affine chart here. And well, again, the Kepler orbits in here are just intersections of this C bar with projective planes. So you can apply any projective transformation to RP3, which preserves this cone or this quadratic. And this will preserve projective transformation, preserve projective planes, so it will preserve the orbits. Turns out this group is exactly this additional three dimension. And then if you trace through all this, you get this formula here. <clears throat> so the, the action is, is very uh, natural in this setting, thanks to, the, thanks to the nice explicit description we have of Kepler orbits. So, next section. Okay, <clears throat> so to start, I don't know, getting some somewhere with this, I need to say a little more of this structure. So a helpful way to think of the space of orbits is, well, they're all the, the orbits are parameterized by ABC. Each one of the ABC gives you a plane, right? By this formula. So this is something sort of standard in projective geometry. The set of planes in projective space is called the dual <coughs> projective dual. It's also a uh, projective space. So we can associate to an ABC, a plane, a point, you know, just ABC are points in, in, uh, in R3. It's, see, I'll convince you, I think, that this R3 should naturally be thought of as R21. In, the flat Minkowski space. <clears throat> so, and well, here's a little formula for if you want to see how the action, if I take an A and a V acting on the Kepler orbits by a symmetry, here's how it moves. You can see it induces an action on the set of Kepler orbits. And this is, it's just exactly translate or apply. Um, they're just uh, these conformal. Minkowski, or Mink, uh, I always mix it up. You usually say Lorentz group, or well, they're the conform, they're the transformations that preserve the flat Minkowski metric up to scale. Okay. And <clears throat> I've drawn here a few kind of, um, I'd say, landmarks. So, for example, if I take a plane 
intersection with C, that's a parabola. This means that the normal direction of this plane lies in the cone. Okay, parabolic sections are, are ones that, you know, just slice along the tangent direction to the cone. So their normal is a vector that lies in the cone. So that means their normal, the, you have this natural null, null cone in the space of orbits, points on the null cone represent parabolas. Conversely, if you, or not conversely, if you take a uh, if you take a plane whose normal vector is is inside this cone here, it means that the plane is intersecting in an in an ellipse, whereas a, a sort of space like point will intersect in a hyperbola, which I didn't draw. You have this this uh, in summary, I guess that you have a null cone here in in the space of orbits, the ABC. The points on the cone are parab parabolas, represent parabolas. The points in interior represent ellipses, and exterior, you have your hyperbolic orbits. Okay, so that's sort of the first thing you can check to see what the planes represented by points over here correspond to. Okay. And, well, you can kind of keep going much further with this. Uh, correspondence. This first line is what we just said. I have a, so I'm going to call them the elliptic parabolic hyperbolic plane intersecting the cone C in an ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola correspond to this, these types of points in R21 ABC. And <clears throat> there's another correspondence. You can look over here in R21 and take lines, or you might also call them pencils of, of Kepler orbits. <clears throat> so for example, here in blue is, is, the, is this null cone, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. A time-like line is something that lies interior to the null cone. A null line is something that lies off, it's like a generator of the cone. The space-like line lies out, outside. So these correspondence are just projective duality. So what you find is that if I take a time-like line, it corresponds over here to a line that's disjoint from C. And well, the usual way you, you take a line of planes and obtain another line is this line is the common intersection of all these planes. So the family of time-like Kepler orbits represents intersections of C with planes that intersect in a fixed line that doesn't intersect C. That makes sense, kind of wordy. But if you think about that, so you have this line that doesn't intersect C and this family of Kepler orbits is obtained by sort of, you know, you can think of like rotating the planes passing through this fixed line and look at their intersection with C. Because this line is disjoint from C, all of the projections will be nested. So a time-like line represents Kepler orbits that are disjoint. So likewise, you can do this similar argument. A null line projects to Kepler orbits, which all intersect in a common point. In fact, they have to be tangent at this fixed point. So null lines in the Minkowski space represent one parameter family of Kepler orbits tangent at a fixed point where space-like lines on parameter of family of Kepler orbits passing through two fixed points once you project them. Okay, so I'm just, um, yeah, I think it is like, you know, making landmarks, like what do, when you're looking in ABC, what do the objects over there correspond to for the Kepler problem? These will be, well, they, they can be useful to, determine properties of this family of curves. Okay. Well, I want to I wanna go further with this uh, same kind of dictionary. What are important <clears throat> Great landmarks? So here I just put again to recall these kind of uh, relations of the parameterization. So here I have a plane 
representing a capital orbit like this. Um, if you're if you want to check these things, you know, C squared, you can show is the angular momentum. If you want to relate things to energy, you can use this. It's called the Runge lens identity, but it's this happens to be this thing. So the norm of this Runge lens vector is one plus two times the energy times the momentum squared. Okay, so you can translate this into conditions on the ABC using this. For example, right, if I <clears throat> if I want to look at the set of orbits, capital orbits having a fixed uh, angular momentum C not equal to zero. Well, C is just gonna be one over C squared. So this means that C, C is just constant. So they're represented by horizontal planes in the ABC space are the orbits of fixed angular momentum. <clears throat> so likewise, just doing sort of algebra with this correspondence, you can, say well if i fix the energy translate that into the conditions on the abc you'll get that orbits with fixed energy are represented <clears throat> by this two-sheeted hyperbola hyperboloid in the minkowski space okay uh I'll explain in a moment you see here it doesn't depend on this sign of the energy so you actually have um both positive and negative energy in this two-sheeted hyperbola. Um, so fixed energy is the same, like we remarked at the beginning, as fixed major axis. And I mean, this is not so dynamical. This this other thing, fixed minor axis, but it's uh, it turns out that fixed minor axes are two-sheeted hyperboloids without a shift. Well. I should explain this plus minus. When you have a minus sign, it's the same. It's a two-sheeted hyperboloid centered at the origin. The minus sign corresponds to elliptic orbits with fixed minor axis because they're all going to be interior to the snow cone. The positive sign is the one-sheeted hyperboloid center at the origin. It represents hyperbolic orbits with a fixed minor axis. I'm writing B for the minor axis. So <clears throat> there's some natural uh, surfaces inside this Minkowski space corresponding to these first two important uh, dynamic and the first integrals of the, of the Kepler problem. And well, this one just because it's uh, it's nice to see what the centered hyperboloid represents. Um, so I made a little picture. Um, so here is what I mean with this, this is the shift of the, this is red is the fixed energy. So if you look at the condition for the equation, it's it's not just any shift of a two sheeted hyperboloid, but it's always tangent to the origin. Okay, so these are the orbits with fixed energy. And well, you see both elliptic and hyperbo hyperbolic orbits with this fixed, you know, norm of energy. So down here in this lower half, you see hyperbolic orbits with positive energy E. And here you see elliptic orbits with fixed energy minus E. Okay. <clears throat> and here is the sort of centered hyperboloid for fixed minor axis. Now, here I, I made a little duality correspondence. So this is sort of the advantage of having invoke this projective geometry. Anytime you have a quadratic surface in the dual space, it corresponds to a quadratic in the original space. But the correspondence is just by taking envelopes. So <clears throat> for example, to go from this PE to PE star, you take for every point of this quadratic, you have a tangent plane. This ABC is a space of planes. So you have a two parameter family of planes, that envelope is the word for this quadratic that defines this surface over here, which it turns out is also a quadratic. And you can go both ways. So planes in ABC space represent points. So you can take all the set of planes here. They correspond to a set of points here, which is enveloped by this family of planes. 
the whole point of all this is it's it's not hard to go back and forth you just do some linear algebra invert the matrix that gives this this quadratic and you find that this dual to it is an inscribed paraboloid in the cone and that what i was saying with the, the connection between these two that a point here represents a tangent point here you recover this kind of interesting result that to obtain orbits with fixed energy, you take a section of the cone by a point on this fixed paraboloid by a tangent plane to a point on this fixed paraboloid. And this is actually an old result given to all, although this proof using projective duality is, is, is completely new. Likewise, you have a description of fixed minor axis orbits. There's an inscribed hyperboloid, you inscribe a hyperboloid in this cone C. If you take a section of the cone by a plane tangent to this fixed hyperboloid, this, these all project to orbits with fixed minor axis. Okay. So some, uh, maybe I should remark too, you can do, you can, if you want to ask what's a general shift of a two-sheeted hyperboloid or, or one-sheeted hyperboloid, these correspond to, to central projections of orbits of the curved Kepler problems. So there's a Kepler problem on a sphere and a Kepler problem in hyperbolic space. If you centrally project these orbits onto the plane, they are Kepler orbits. They have different energies. The energy is not just the major axis. And if you, if you want to parameterize them, you get a general shifted hyperboloid. And you also get descriptions of these as intersections of the cone by planes tangent to some fixed quadratic in the R3 in the XYZ space. All right. Okay. Um, well, I think this was all the kind of sort of a quick, very quick kind of tour of all these, you know, getting, getting used to what points in ABC space mean for, for the actual orbits in the plane. Um, any questions or anything? Is it? I haven't done any details, but these are all kind of things that you get kind of just by the projective picture and setup that we have. Okay. So, <clears throat> well, this is all kind of. I think this is all kind of fun, you know, to get these kind of surprising things that if you take tangent planes to an inscribed hyperbolic, they are suddenly project to orbits of fixed energy. But what I want to finish for the last parts is about, you know, maybe using these more to make some, some more interesting statements. So the, the first thing I want to share is, is a analog of the four vertex theorem for Kepler orbits. So the four vertex theorem is something from, is a very classic thing in differential geometry. It says if you have a curve in the plane that's convex, simple. Uh, well, at each point of the curve, you can take its osculating circle. This is a circle that's uh, has second order contact, they say, with the curve. So you could also think of it as you fix a point on the curve. Uh, the curve has a tangent line. You take the limit of circles passing through this fixed point and another point on the curve and tangent to the to the curve as that point approaches the fixed point. Um, so this will be a circle with second order contact with the plane curve the osculating circle and in general it will just have second order contact but it may be a special case that in fact this osculating circle approximates the curve better to third order contact or more okay so these are called vertices these special points of the curve where the osculating circle uh, has has more than second order contact uh, but you can do this with any three parameter family of curves. You can say, take a point on the curve, 
that is t tangent. Take the limit of of curves in the family passing through the through two fixed points and tangent at this line as the point approaches the fixed point. This will give you a curve of the three parameter family with second order contact with this this curve gamma in the plane. And so this we can call an osculating Kepler orbit because these are the three parameter family of curves we consider. So in general, it will just have second order, but it may be the case that at some special points of this curve gamma, you have higher order contact uh, with, a, with a Kepler orbit. So, well, maybe for example, you know, a Kepler orbit itself has infinite order contact at every point with its osculating orbit is the Kepler orbit. And <clears throat> well, the four vertex theorems for Kepler orbit says that if you take a closed simple curve, it's convex, there are always at least four Kepler vertices, four points where these approximating Kepler orbits have higher than the expected order of contact. And it's just the, you know, the exact same thing works if you replace it with the osculating circles. That's the classic one. <clears throat> this is the Kepler four vertex theorem. And I've I, I got, a, I got ah. a quick question about uh, your yeah. um, about this for this Kepler four vertex theorem. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Does the uh, does the fixed focus of the, the Kepler orbit, uh, does this theorem say anything about where that, that point would be located or uh, like does uh, it necessarily have to be in the interior or uh, like can, can you, is it possible to say more about, uh, about these Kepler orbits aside from that there have to be at least the, these four vertices or is that kind of the, the extent of this theorem? Yeah, this is where we have it now. But yeah, that's good. So there's a lot more, I think, to play with with this thing. Uh, yeah, like you. Well, so so the the sun is always fixed. But what's interesting is to ask like, what happens? To, there's two foci for every Kepler orbit, and this second focus um, is uh, well. We think that it. So the second focus should be the analog. It's, it looks like in the pictures, the second focus should be the analog of the centers of curvature of osculating circles. So um, let me maybe say the Euclidean version. So with the, with the Euclidean version, you have these osculating circles. The centers of the circles trace out the caustic of the curve or the, um, the centers of curvature is called, right? And, and points that are vertices where, the, where these osculating circles have higher order contact correspond to cusps of the centers of these curvature. And we see the same thing if we trace out the second foci of these osculating Kepler orbits. So every point where there's a Kepler vertex, the locus of the second foci of these, of these Kepler orbits as you go around the curve, you trace out another curve, uh, a cusp of these, this locus of second foci correspond to um, the, the points where the, the osculating Kepler conic had higher order contact. But yeah, I, I think we haven't shown that, that or anything, so. Great, thanks. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting things you can ask about, yeah, the foci. And you can, you can see the foci in this picture, but I, I'm not, I didn't talk about it yet because, well, to us, it's still kind of, not uh, so easy to work with yet, the second foci. But, but yeah, that would be nice to add uh, some analog of a caustic or Kepler caustic. Yeah, but well, so this is yeah, at least the first little thing. There's always at least four vertices. And well, I'll just say how you could, well, it's a little cheap how I'm going to prove it because I'm just going to tell you that it's equivalent to the four vertex theorem that that we know with circles, the Euclidean four vertex theorem. And then, well, there are lots of proofs of the Euclidean one. <clears throat> so uh, the the fact that allows you to say these two are equivalent. Here's the x y plane where I have my Kepler orbits and. Here I have AB plane. So lines in the Kepler plane are 
parameterized by two numbers a and b there's a question of a general line not passing through the the sun um, but a general affine line in the plane is given by an equation such as this the a b plane is the point in this plane is a line in the x y plane so to a, a kepler orbit here uh, e i can take all its tangent lines the each tangent line here is a point in the a b plane and the, the the nice fact is that this set of lines tangent to a kepler orbit is a circle in the a b plane okay in fact you can see this without doing basically any computation if you believe some of the things i told you up there about no lines so here's abc this r21 this a point in abc is a kepler orbit so here is this point in abc <clears throat> and one of the things we said is that if two kepler orbits two points in the abc space are connected by a null line then the corresponding curves are tangent at a fixed point another thing i didn't really say but if you take c equal to zero in this correspondence that we had above it's exactly this correspondence so a point in the c equals zero plane is an affine line in the xy plane it's like the projection of the intersection of this cone c with a vertical plane so it projects to a line in the xy plane so we just draw this null cone to find all the lines tangent to e we draw the null cone through e and intersect it with the c equal to zero plane and well, if you intersect this right cone with the with the a b plane that's a circle and that's exactly this dual of the Kepler orbit. And this correspondence of duality preserves orders of contact. So given a curve in the Kepler plane, you just take its dual. High order approximation by Kepler orbits is just high order approximation by circles. So it's exactly the, the same as the usual four vertex theorem involving order of contact of circles. So you can just take your favorite proof of the Euclidean one. You can also prove the Kepler one directly by computation, if you like. But the point is they're equivalent. <clears throat> so, okay, so that's the first little fun, fun thing we get to see. Uh, so, uh, do I go till seven o'clock? Is that? Um, or do, yeah, do yeah. You, seven. Okay, cool. So I wanted to. Just keep going with kind of, I, I think of these as just like fun little facts about Kepler orbits. And um, this, that first one is, is essentially entirely geometric. Uh, these next ones will, will be a little more um, having to do with dynamics, say. So <clears throat> this, this next thing is, is an analog of something you may know for um, orbit, for Parabolas. So, you know, if you have a constant gravitational field, you know, Q double dot is minus G, G is a fixed vector, like vertical parabolas. Um, then if you take a one parameter, you fix a point, you think of this as like the source where the firework exploded. Like it, this, this is like the standard model for particles above the Earth's surface. And the Earth is like an infinite plane. So you fix some point, which is like the explosion point, and you look at all the parabolas or the orbits of this emanating from this point with a fixed energy, right? Because well, they all came from the same explosion, so you assume they all just start with the same energy. So you have the, it turns out this is a one parameter family of para vertical parabolas in this case, passing to a fixed point. And the envelope of them is again a vertical parabola. So this is a sort of very classic thing about constant gravity or vertical parabolas. And <clears throat> well, the point is there's an analogous result for Kepler orbits. Um, it's it's not this is not a new result that we found here, but we find proof. So <clears throat> So, well, this is the, the result. If you take a fixed point in the plane and you look 
at all the Kepler, I'm stating it for ellipses. If you look at all the Kepler ellipses with a fixed energy that come out from this point, if you look at the envelope, that's to say a curve that's tangent to all of the all of these Kepler ellipses, it's another Kepler ellipse. And also this statement also uh, can be made a little stronger. This actual second Kepler ellipse has its second focus at the fixed point where, past, where all of these were passing through. But we have the well, yeah, we uh, it's it's not that part is not as easy to prove as just the easier statement I wrote here. So, although you can do it with this dual projective picture, mm. but the the easy one to prove is this this first thing um, that if you take uh, a fixed point and you look at all the ellipses with fixed minor axes going to this fixed point. The envelope of this family is a Kepler parabola, a parabola with a fixed focus at the same, you know, the same sun. Right? It's not just some random parabola or random ellipse. These are also orbits of the same dynamical system. Well, well unparameterized orbits. Okay, so that's the that's the Kepler firework statement analogous to this one you may uh, know for for constant gravity. There's also one for uh, inverse square law with the sun. So I'll prove this one. And this is a corollary of this because, well, something I maybe should have said earlier, you have this fixed minor axis <coughs> hyperboloid of two sheets, because I'm talking about ellipses here. And the fixed energy one is just a shift of it. And a shift is a point symmetry because all of our point symmetries correspond to translations or <clears throat> you know, Lorentz rotations or scalings of the ABC space. In particular, just vertical translation is a corresponds to a transformation of the plane that takes everything with fixed minor axis to things with fixed energy. So if you can prove something about fixed minor axis, you, that, that only depends on, you know, um, tangency such as envelope right and passing to a fixed point then it's preserved by the image of this under that point transformation the similar statement holds for the fixed energy things it turns out if you look at where a parabola goes under this, this point transformation it goes to an elliptic orb okay so i'm just going to prove this first one these these two are this are also completely the same by just doing vertical shifts because they're both given by hyperboloids of two sheets, these families. Well, these families when you don't fix the point. Okay, uh, let me sketch. This is the proof I wanted to sketch. So <clears throat> one way you can prove this is using, so it's, it's just playing with projective geometry. These are like, you have projective duality. It's like a standard thing. That's how we did all these first part with this correspondences. Another thing you use in projective geometry is the polar or polarity with respect to some quadratic. So here I've drawn in the ABC space in blue is the usual null cone. Here in green is this hyperboloid, just the upper half say for fixed minor axis orbits. And it turns out if you fix a point in the Kepler plane, project duality goes both ways. So a, a point on the cone in R3 corresponds to a plane in the ABC space that intersects the cone in a parabola. Because we, we said it the other way, but you can also go back from ABC to XYZ. Um, but anyways, so this the set of all these minor axis guys passing to a fixed point are obtained by intersecting this quadratic with a, a plane that's, uh, I, we, I, we call them parabolic planes. So I can intersect this plane with the, with the cone. In blue, you get a parabola. Intersecting with this two-sheeted hyperboloid, it's, it's a, what you might call it a horror cycle of this hyperboloid. Anyways, in red here, this intersection are all the minor axis guys pass, passing to some fixed point. And we want to find some other point so that if you connect any two of these lines, it's it's a a null line, you know, something that is um, it's 
Lorentz norm is zero. So there's this construction that you can take polar of a plane with respect to a conic, with respect to yeah, a, a quadratic, not a conic. So the way you find the polar is you intersect all of the tangent planes passing through this intersection. Turns out those always intersect in a point, which I call pi perp. Perp because if you write it in R4, it's just taking orthogonal complement with respect to this inner product. Okay, <clears throat> so you get this point. It turns out this point is on the null cone. And then I claim that half of this point, scale it by half, this thing is the envelope okay, of this family. That's to say, if you connect this to any point on this intersection, the norm of this is a, this is a null line. They span a null line. And this is on the blue null cone, so it's a parabola core. So these two conditions, so here is the Minkowski inner product. So this thing that I said, that pi, the polar of a parabolic plane is a point on the cone, just means that its norm is zero, this Minkowski norm. The condition of being a polar, that it lies on the tangent planes for every beta in this intersection, you can write in terms of the Lorentz inner product in this way. And then well, you, you just check that what I said is true, that if you take half of this, then for every point beta in this intersection, this, this is a null direction. And it's just follow straight from this. So that's the, the firework the linear algebra proof. Mm. And okay, I get a little bit the last part. I'll just say one more uh, little application, which is a, a type of Lambert theorem. So the usual Lambert theorem involves the following situation. You have some Kepler orbit, two points, and the classic Lambert theorem is a relation between the time of travel under the, you know, the constant area sweeping, the time of travel between these two points to these distances to the sun and the distance R12, it's a little small there, but the chord length, you call it. So it's a relation between this chord length in fact, for usual Lambert, it's the sum of these distances to the sun and the major axis or the energy. So you have a relation between time increment, chord length, sum of distances to the sun and energy in the usual Lambert theorem. But in this setup, we get kind of very, very simply, we get a different one, sort of just because centered hyperboloid in the dual space are easy to manipulate. So if we fix the minor axis, same thing, and we look at this increment in eccentric anomaly, which is another usual way to parameterize Kepler orbits that I, I, probably, I won't say anything really about. But then you have the same sort of thing that this increment in eccentric anomaly is, is determined by the minor axis as opposed to the major axis. And the chord length and the difference of the of the distances to the sun as opposed to the sum. Okay. And the way you so it's just a, a simple formula here. This is how they're related. And the way you can prove it is to notice that minor if I if I look at this picture in R3, minor axis orbits as intersections of the cone by planes tangent to a fixed hyperboloid inscribed in the cone. Well, if I apply any element of SO21 acting linearly on R3, it preserves this hyperboloid. So it preserves the minor axis. It will preserve the tangent, the sections of the cone by planes tangent to the hyperboloid. It will preserve this quantity because this quantity ends up just being the, the Minkowski norm between the two points on the orbit lifted to the cone. So it preserves this quantity, which is over here. And it preserves delta u, which ends up being the, if you, if you take the Minkowski metric and restrict it to the arc and integrate that along the arc, this turns out to be exactly this eccentric anomaly, another type of parameterization of Kepler orbits. So all these things are invariant is the point under this, this type of symmetry preserving minor axis. So you can apply an element taking any 
such orbit to a circular orbit, and it's very easy to check. That's the idea of using symmetries to help with the geometry, right? You, you have some situation and you try to apply a symmetry to an easier to analyze one. And any relation you'll find at this one, in terms of invariance under this, this symmetry is valid everywhere. So um, yeah, that was the last little thing we got. And um, yeah, so that's everything I wanted to share. Thanks.